thanks for coming and welcome to uh, the LSE. If it's your first time here, we hope uh, after today's event you may come back again. But uh, this evening uh, is a, um, a talk, uh, a presentation, plus the opportunity for a discussion in the LX LSE Works Lecture Series. Uh, this is a series of um, presentations of, based on the research work of the LSE uh, to um, an audience of students and uh, friends of the LSE. The object of the exercise, obviously, is to highlight some of the things that go on here in an accessible and hopefully interesting way. Um, this is um, the third series of LSE Works uh, presentation, and uh, this evening's lecture is the first of this year's um, series. Um, the next series after this, in case this is not quite your cup of tea, is Neighbours, Peers and Educational Achievement, and that will actually be here um, next week, um, Thursday the 22nd of January, in the same place. To make this series really simple, it's always in the same place at the same time, 6.30 on Thursdays. So even I can remember that. Yeah. Now, um, this is my first opportunity to actually be modern and tell you that you can follow tonight's lecture on, um, on a hashtag, LSE Works. I think that's Twitter. Yes, so <laughs> apparently they're not twits that do twittering, it's a tweeter. Right? So those tweeters amongst you can happily follow this lecture in that way. So it's a great pleasure for me uh, this evening to um, introduce actually my colleague. So it's my first opportunity to introduce one of these. You know, but it just turns out that I'm introducing my close colleague and friend, Professor Daniel Ferreira, who's a professor in the Department of Finance and uh, where he runs the uh, uh, works in corporate governance and he directs the uh, corporate governance and LSE uh, program which is a joint initiative I believe of the financial markets group and the law department here at LSE. So without more ado, since you're not here to listen to me, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start proceedings off but just before we begin let me tell you the rules because I'm a very rules type person. Okay, so Daniel's going to speak for roughly 45 minutes and then you'll have an opportunity to ask him questions and engage with him for roughly 45 minutes and then we'll bring the proceedings to an end. And hopefully at the end of all of this you'll have learned something. So Daniel, okay. the floor is yours. I'm going to go and sit down here. I'll be back in 45 minutes. So um, thank you, David, and thanks everyone for coming. And this is my presentation. Um, I would like to start with a little bit of advertising for our corporate governance at LSE uh, group, which is an interdisciplinary group, involves people not only from finance department, but from other departments as well, notably the law department, but also management department. It is housed at the Financial Markets Group and is dedicated to the study of corporate governance issues. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about some of the research that we have done. But also, there are other things that we do, such as, for example, to run a series of regular events. So I would like to encourage you, um, in particular to check out our corporate governance research debates, um, which has a lot of interesting things coming up. So if you're interested to learn more about us, please check our website. And if you want to be in the mailing list, um, send, us, send us an email. And now, let me start. So the title of this presentation is uh, Corporate Boards, uh, Myths and Facts. So I thought it would be appropriate if I first defined what I meant by myth and fact. So this is my definition of a myth. 
Uh, myth is what I think is false. And accordingly, a fact is what I think is true. Okay? So unfortunately, uh, these are not universal definitions of <laughs> myth and fact as, as much as I wish them to be. Um, so perhaps uh, a more accurate title for the presentation today should have been corporate boards, things that I think are false and things that I think are true. But i chosen the catchier title, Myths and Facts. So joking aside, um, what I will refer to as myths in this presentation would be claims that are mostly backed by little or no evidence, or at least in my view, by highly selective and academically suspicious evidence. And the facts will be things that are backed by evidence that I think most of us would agree uh, that are that is credible evidence. Okay. Now, I just want to say one more thing about uh, the use of evidence in this presentation. Um, I will refer to evidence in this presentation in a very informal way. So I would not spend any time saying things such as, well, this evidence comes from this paper written by so and so. So I'm not I would not be too much concerned with attribution, and this is not because I think that attribution is not important. I think attribution is very important. It's just that the goal of this presentation is to give you an overview of the topic rather than to give detailed explanations of individual papers. Now, if you are interested in the details, what you can do is to go to the LSE Works website where this presentation will be uploaded, I think by tomorrow, and there you will also find uh, a list of, reference, of references of papers that I have used to produce this presentation. So if you want to know the details of which papers I got, uh, I used to um, in order to uh, make some of my claims, you will find them there, but not in the presentation today, simply uh, to make things flow more smoothly. Okay. Now, these are the five corporate governance myths that I want to talk about today. These are not the only ones, but then again, remember what I, what I said before, these are, these are things I think are false. Um, I will explain each of them in detail, um, but for now let me just list them so we remember what they are. Uh, the first one is what I call the unconstrained managers and helpless owners myth. The number two is the idea that boards don't matter. Number three is the idea that at least some or most boards behave as if they are lap dogs. So I'll explain what this is later on. Number four is the idea that boards should behave as watchdogs. And finally, number five is the one size fit all issue. So let me start with myth <coughs> number one. The unconstrained managers, helpless owners. So this is the idea that CEOs and managers can do pretty much whatever they want with little concern for shareholders. And there's little that shareholders can do to stop them. Okay? So this is a known idea that dates back at least to the famous book by Burley and Means that has been written more that was written more than 80 years ago. And in that book, Burley and Means, they noted that the modern corporation was so large and its notional owners, the shareholders, were so many and so small that effectively they had no way to influence the decisions of these companies. And as a consequence of that, managers were pretty much unconstrained and could do roughly whatever they wanted. Now, I think that today, few people believe in such an extreme and simplistic version of the story that I just told you. But I think it's still true that many people believe in a weak version of this story. That, sure, there are constraints. It's not like CEOs and managers can do whatever they want. But to a large extent, CEOs can run their companies most of the time with little or no regard for the interests of shareholders. So I think this view is still very prevalent. So I would claim that this is a myth, and these would be my facts. So first fact is that although this idea of the separation of ownership and control um, clearly is clearly correct 
to a large extent for a number of companies, and especially large companies, and especially, and perhaps the most important companies. It's still the case that most companies around the world are still closely owned and run by the same people, okay? By the same individuals, families, and government. And in such companies, there's really no meaningful distinction between managers and owners, okay? Now, of course, there are other companies, and perhaps the largest companies, perhaps the most important companies, in which there's a significant degree of separation between ownership and control. And you find most of these companies in the UK and in the US, but you also find them elsewhere. Now, just because there is a significant degree of separation of ownership and control, it does not follow that CEOs and managers can do whatever they want, or they can just go and take decisions without any regard to shareholders' interests. And the reason for that is that there exists a number of other governance mechanisms. So here you have a long list, which I'm not go through, right? This is just to list a number of possible uh, governance mechanisms. And you will see that I've put boards at the top. That does not mean that this is the most important mechanism. It's, it's, it's there because it's the only one we're going to talk about today, because that's the topic of the presentation today. Now, boards could be one solution to this problem, because at <coughs> least, uh, theoretically, um, directors and are appointed to the board in order to represent the interests of shareholders and to put constraints on what managers and CEOs do. If so, if they do their job correctly, then this problem of helpless uh, owners and unconstrained managers doesn't really exist. But now, if you look more broadly at the academic evidence, there are many papers written on each of these different governance mechanisms. And in a nutshell, if you look at the evidence as a whole, you find that each of these mechanisms, they have at least some bite. So that's what we have found from, from the evidence, is that you know, if you study each of these mechanisms in separation, you'll find that they do place significant constraints on managers. So once we take this into account, it becomes very hard to believe in a story in which um, managers can do pretty much whatever they want, and there are no, not much constraints. If anything, the, the evidence sort of suggests that there are a lot of different ways in which these governance mechanisms can place constraints on managers. So let's go to myth number two, which uh, is the idea that boards don't matter. Now you may think that's, that's a strange myth. Surely no one believes that. Right? It's sort of silly. Why, you know, if, if we are here to discuss boards, we all believe that boards should matter in some way. But now let me play the devil's advocate a little bit and try to argue that that's not such a silly idea. That actually makes sense. You could actually make a very reasonable case for the idea that boards don't really matter in practice. And the reason is very simple. Suppose you believe in the things I just said in the previous slide. If it is true that there's so many governance mechanisms out there, suppose that some of them are so efficient or you know, so effective that you really have no incremental contribution of boards to the governance of corporations. So for example, suppose that the takeover market is so well developed and so efficient that every time that a CEO is not doing what he or she is supposed to do and is in a way um, running the company to the ground, then the company is gonna be taken over by you know, some buyer and the CEO is going to be replaced. And just because of that, perhaps the CEO will behave in the proper way. And if this works extremely well, maybe we don't need to have boards at all. Maybe boards exist, but just for symbolic reasons. Right? There's nothing really they can do. So I just try to argue that this myth, what I call a myth, is actually not so silly as it sounds. You know, you, you can come up with a, with a reasonable case for it. Nevertheless, I'm going to claim that this is not true. So I'm going to give you some facts uh, taken from some empirical papers and the corporate governance literature. Uh, the first one it may sound a bit strange and maybe a bit morbid, but let me tell you what this is. Um, a number of papers have found that sudden deaths of some directors affect stock prices. So, and here, when I mention directors, I'm talking about non-executive directors. So every time I mention directors here, we're talking about non-executive directors most of the time, okay? So what is the idea? Well, in the event 
of a death of a director, which is a sad event. Still, life goes on. And especially in the stock market, definitely mark, uh, uh, life goes on. Okay? So if some investors have the belief that the director that just died was a very good director and is, was going to, and is going to be very difficult to replace this director with another director of a similar quality, then it's reasonable to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to assume that, that some of these investors will find that, well, maybe we should sell our shares because this company is not going to be as good as before because it's going to be difficult to replace this particular director. And therefore, the stock price would fall as a consequence of that. So it happens that this seems to be true, at least in some cases. I'm not going to get into the details again. But there are a number of papers showing that those sudden deaths of directors, they have stock market implications. So at least for one thing we know, the boards do matter, that they can affect stock prices, at least when some good director you know, all of a sudden disappear. Now, a completely different piece of evidence of a completely different nature is the following. Um, some people have also documented that directors of firms that experience proxy contests find it difficult to obtain additional board appointments. Now, let me first explain what a proxy contest is. Okay? Um, suppose you hold shares in a company, and the time has come for the board to be re-elected, or at least for some directors of the board to be re-elected. And then the company will send you um, documents saying, well, these are the directors that we want to reelect. And suppose you are unhappy with them. You don't like these directors. You want to replace them with some other directors. Okay? Now, what you could do, there's a huge cost in doing so, but in principle, what you could do is to come up with an alternative slate of directors and to compete with these officially nominated directors. So if you manage to do so, and there are many hurdles you have to jump, but if you manage to do so, what you will have is a contest between these two slates, and then at the shareholders meeting, you're going to vote for one or the other. Now, proxy contests are actually much more common than people think they are, and especially in the United States, and especially more recently. Mo you know, many people have this idea that those proxy contests actually never happened, and this is not true. There's actually some significant uh, uh, amount of proxy contests uh, out there. Now, to me, this evidence clearly demonstrates that shareholders surely believe that directors matter. First, why would they bother to have proxy contests in the first place? Right? So that's direct evidence that they care, that they actually think that boards do matter. But more than this, because you could claim, well, maybe these are just some fickle shareholders, shareholders that don't know better, but the vast majority of shareholders don't really care about who is running the company. But the fact that if you are a director targeted by a proxy contest, and even if you don't lose your seat, it becomes more difficult for you to get additional board appointments in other companies later on. So that suggests that shareholders out there, shareholders at large, they see a proxy contest as bad news about the particular director, and then they no longer want to touch that director. So then again, this, is, so this suggests that uh, at least shareholders believe that directors matter. Now, if you want to see more direct evidence of directors affecting the running of, the, uh, of a company or affecting um, the productivity and the profitability of companies, you have to look elsewhere. It's going to be difficult to look in the, to find this in the UK and the US simply because the quality of the data for doing that kind of analysis is not good enough. Surprisingly, I guess to some people, in China, we can have better data to uh, address some of these questions. Right? So China is actually a great country for us to study corporate governance in terms of data availability. So some, pe some researchers have found that in China, the hiring of directors with foreign experience improves their firm's performance. So what is this? Say local companies in China, when they hire non-executive directors that had experience, business experience outside China, when they are hired by these companies, you see a lot of things changing. The governance change, uh, uh, the quality of governance changes. You also see more exports, and you find an increase in, in, in productivity and increase in, in, in firm performance and profitability. 
right? And I think this is a very careful study, and I think I'm quite convinced that this is really true. And it's difficult to replicate this elsewhere. But then again, I think this should be clear evidence that despite of all the other um, governance mechanisms out there, boards still matter. So let's go to myth number three. Myth number three is perhaps a cynical variation of myth number two. It's the idea that perhaps boards should matter, but in fact they don't matter because directors choose not to put any constraints on the CEO. In other words, the directors, they behave as if they are lapdogs of the CEO. So they are tame and they are friendly and they never disagree with the CEO, okay? Um, what, is, what is the basic evidence for this? I mean, this is, this is a very widespread view among many people and, um, and I think it's, it's a reasonable view because if you go and talk to directors, often you will find directors that have been on many boards and they will say, well, boards don't really do anything. We never really disagree with the CEO. We never vote against management. And, and therefore, this is certainly what happens in other boards as well. Right? And especially for us, the researchers, it's very difficult to look inside the board. It's very difficult to get data from, uh, about what's happening inside the board. So even if there is disagreement that is not reflected in voting, we still cannot see it most of the time, right? So this explains the myth. Now, what are some of the facts that, that, that we have that question this, this view? We don't have to look only inside the boardroom to get evidence of disagreement. So for example, some people have looked at directors that publicly announce their, res their resignations. And one of the findings is, is that half of the directors that publicly announce that they're resigning from, from their posts, they leave while criticizing the firm. So they go and, and say, well, the firm's not doing well, and that's why I'm stepping down. So there is some open disagreement that we can find there. Even in China, I would say, uh, remember China, so even in China there is evidence that some independent directors disagree with management. And how do we know that? It's because in China there are regulations that require um, uh, you to disclose uh, the votes of people who disagreed with some specific proposals. And if you disagreed with a specific proposal, you also have to explain why you did. So you would think that perhaps in a place in which conformity is highly valued that you wouldn't see a lot of this. But the fact that you do see some, to me, suggests that you know, the disagreement is much more widespread than we think. If it happens in China where we can actually see, it surely happens elsewhere as well. But finally, what I think is the most convincing piece of evidence, and this is something that you find in many different papers that have been able to replicate these findings, is that um, CEOs are more likely to be replaced or to be fired, if you want to call it that way, um, because of bad performance, if your board is more independent and there are different papers measuring independence in different ways, but they all sort of conclude that if the board is more independent, the link between performance and CEO replacement is stronger. So that to me uh, sort of proves that, well, if, even if some boards are indeed lap dogs, it's not necessarily all of them, and there will be a significant amount of boards out there that will be um, um, monitoring the CEO quite closely. Now, let me go for myth number four, and which is the watchdog dog board. Actually, this is not the opposite of the previous myth. It is possible that people, people believe in both myths, in the lap dog board and the watchdog board at the same time, and I'll explain why. So the watchdog board is more of a normative myth, is an idea of what boards should do. Okay, so let me explain this. Um, the myth is based on the idea that boards only have one role, which is to monitor the CEO and other executives. And of course, if that's your only role, you want the board to be as tough as possible, right? Because that's the only thing they do. So the people who believe in this story, they are quite happy to accept that maybe some boards are lap dogs, but what they should be is a watchdog. Now, 
these are the problems with this watchdog view of boards. So the first problem is that this view does not recognize that boards perform multiple functions. Surely they do monitor management, that's one thing they do, uh, but they also do other things. They spend most of their time discussing um, strategy and advising management more generally, and I'm using advi you know, advising in a much general sense, not in a consulting sense. And in some cases, they also provide connections with the external environment. You know, sometimes you have lawyers on the board, sometimes you have politicians on the, on the board, and it might be useful for different reasons. Um, so that's the first uh, problem. And the second problem, which is related to the first one, is that this view does not recognize that tough monitoring is not always good. Sometimes tough monitoring could be bad. Now, on the basis of this idea, um, so Renee Adams, my co-author, and I, uh, some time ago, we wrote this paper um, arguing that these management-friendly boards, or the laptop boards, if you want to call them that way, are sometimes optimal, and especially when the advisory role of boards is very valuable. And in a nutshell, the story is very simple. Um, CEOs have a lot of soft and firm-specific information that is relevant for decision-making, both for monitoring and advising, uh, from the point of view of boards, and most non-executive directors will not have this ex will not have this uh, will not have the access to this information unless the CEO is willing to reveal that information to them. Now, if it is the case that the CEOs are suspicious of the board, they don't trust the board. If if they think that boards are just out there to get them, then very naturally they're going to reveal this information in a very selective way. They're going to with, with, uh, uh, withhold some of this information. And then the communication between the board and the CEO is not going to be perfect. So in cases in which you want to improve the quality of this communication, you may want to have a board that is more friendly to the CEO. But of course, there are costs and benefits. So if you become more friendly to CEO, maybe you're not going to be such a great monitor. But then you just have to trade off these two things. Okay? Now, that was our story. So what is the evidence? So there's some evidence of this direct mechanism related to communication. There is some evidence that, indeed, friendship ties between CEOs and directors improve communication. Right? So at least uh, it seems to be consistent with the story that we're talking about. But more generally, there's, there, there is a number of papers showing that director independence is not always good. There are many circumstances and many cases in which direct independence appears to um, uh, be bad for performance to often is detrimental to performance and you can't really explain this with a view in which independence is always good. It must have costs and benefits. Um, and maybe one of the things that independent boards do, do too much which is not necessarily good is clearly exemplified in a couple of papers that show that CEOs are often fired you know, for reasons outside their control. So what does that mean? I mean, you know, if stock price is going down, but it's very clear that it's not because of the CEO, it's because of the whole market is going down. Still, it is more likely that the CEO is, it's still, it's very likely the CEO is going to be fired. So if you are very tough on the CEO, if you hold the CEO, the CEO accountable for every drop in the stock price, sometimes you're going to be firing a good CEO, and that's certainly not good for you. Okay. So now, Finally, I get to myth number five, which is the one, the last one, and the one I'm going to spend most time talking about. It's the one size fit all myth. Now, let me start with the question. So, typically, when I tell people that I do research on governance, that I do research on boards, and especially if, you're, if they are uh, from the industry, they ask me this question. So what makes an effective board? And that's an excellent question. And that's surely um, probably the most important question that we would like to answer if you're doing research on boards. And so it's not surprising that most academics, most researchers, they, they are trying to answer exactly this question. Okay, so there are many papers trying to address exactly this question. So what is the typical answer that you find in most papers? Well, the typical answer will look like this. 
Okay? The typical answer would be a list of attributes. So what makes an effective board? Maybe a board that has same amount of all these attributes. Okay? And uh, how, what is the typical approach? I think the typical approach can be easily explained in the following way. Um, you first decide which characteristic you want to look at. Maybe it's independence, maybe it's board size, or maybe something else. And then you want to see, you conjecture that this may affect the performance of firms. Okay? So they also need data on performance, and you decide what's the best measure of performance. It could be profitability, it could be uh, stock market valuation, or whatever you think is the most appropriate measure of performance. And then you do some statistical analysis in which you regress um, performance measures on board characteristics, and you find which ones are good and which ones are bad. So typical examples of this are papers that ask the following question. Does board independence improve firm performance? That's one of the most popular questions out there. Another popular question is, do small boards improve firm performance? And more recently, this question, this final question here, has also become uh, very popular. So does board gender diversity improve firm performance? Okay. Um, now, what is the answer? This literature is way too large for me to, um, to, to be able to summarize it properly. So what I've done here is to go through a number of papers and try, and, and, and try to compile a list of things that people have found to be good. Okay? So let me go through them. So an effective board is a board that is independent, usually as independent as it can be, has some industry expertise, it's small, connected, reputable, comprised only of CEOs. That means that all the members of your board should be CEOs of other companies. Um, you should have at least three women, and they all should be CEOs, as you know. Okay? Um, no one should be busy, and uh, the definition of busy in this literature is whether you have many other appointments other than your board appointments. Now, don't ask me how you're going to get CEOs that are not busy, and, but I'm, I'm just reporting the facts. And finally, no foreigners. So that's a big no-no. You should never have a foreigner on your board because that's bad for performance. OK, now, if you think that this sounds a, a little bit too much and maybe perhaps a little bit silly, of course, I'm, this is a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, obviously, right? But if you think that this is a little bit silly, you would be right. There are many problems with this approach. So the first thing is that most of these papers are only looking at the benefits of having some of these characteristics. And they don't think about the costs. So for example, um, even if a small firm could manage to get only CEOs on their board, the question is, this is not easy. So that's going to be very costly even to be able to convince all these people to be on your board. The question is, is the benefit from having an all CEO board, you know, sufficient to offset the cost of having to have all these guys on the board. And these questions are almost never uh, asked. So that's one obvious point. Um, another problem is that many of these things conflict with each other, as you can see, right? So normally if you want a board that's very independent, it's very difficult to get people with industry expertise because people with industry expertise will tend to be less independent and so on and so forth. So there are conflicts between these things. So it's difficult to get all of them together. But finally, even from a, from a, a more intuitive point of view, it's, not, it's more about how these things interact with each other. Right? So you have a board with some independent directors, some experts, and, and some this and some that. And they will work in one way. And then you have a board with a different mix and maybe they would achieve the same thing. And there could be many mixes of these characteristics that deliver the same results. And even more, maybe some mixes are better for some firms and worse for some others. So it's the idea of that you know, one size really does not fit all. So if you really believe in this kind of answer, implicitly you have to believe that one size fits all. I can always look at each characteristic in isolation and say this is good and this is bad. But once you accept a more complicated view of the world that one size does not fit all, so that's probably not the right way of answering this question. So I'll propose an alternative way 
of answering this question. What makes an effective board? And rather than a list of attributes, I think it's better to try to answer this with a list of forces and conditions. So if you ask me what makes an effective board, I'll say maybe it's a combination of forces that gives incentives for boards to behave in the proper way. So what could these be? It could obviously be financial incentives, but it could also be reputational incentives. It could be just ethical motives. If you just have ethical uh, board members, maybe you don't need financial incentives or anything else. This could also work. Or maybe none of these work and you need laws and regulations to make sure that people behave in the right way. Perhaps people behave properly because they worry about how they're going to be portrayed in the media. Uh, or maybe there are behavioral biases, or maybe markets and competitions who do the trick, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a more reasonable way of trying to answer um, this question. Now, going back to this picture in which board characteristics affect for performance, let's try to understand this idea a little, uh, a little bit more. Even if we do believe that we can find characteristics and they affect for performance, we still have to think through the channels through which this happens, right? It's not straightforward that you get more independent directors and firms become more profitable. There must be something in the middle. So the first point is that there are many characteristics that will combine together and hopefully they will affect the behavior of the board, the dynamics of the board. And I will claim that this is a necessary condition for characteristics to matter. Right? If the characteristics of the board don't really affect the way that the board behaves, so clearly any relationship between these characteristics and performance is spurious. It must be explained by something else. So this is a necessary condition. But then different conditions, different characteristics will lead to different behaviors, but the board as a collective entity will make decisions. So the behavior will lead to decisions. So board, the board will make some decisions. But then the decisions of the board will fit in firm decisions. Like most decisions made by firms on a day-to-day -day basis are not made at the board level. They are influenced by policies set by the board, but not necessarily made by the board itself. So there is a the board may influence the firm decisions, but not necessarily taking all the firm decisions. And finally, we get from firm decisions to firm performance. So if you really want to understand the link between board structure and performance, perhaps we need to understand every step along the way as well. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to really understand why some board structure may be good or bad for performance. But that's not the end of this, because board structure is also a choice. So board structure is not the first step. Someone is appointing people to the board. Okay? So there are things that affect the uh, selection of board members. So we need to understand those things as well if we want to paint a, a complete picture. But that's not the end of it, right? So things can get even more complicated because there are things that affect, um, that affect all, these other, um, all these particular decisions. I'm just calling them environmental factors. So for example, um, the legal system. So the legal system will affect who has the right to appoint directors on specific situations, okay? So we will have an effect here, but it will also constrain the decisions that the board can make, you know, what kind of decisions the board can make, what kind of decisions the board cannot make. It will also constrain the decisions of the firm, and it will also directly affect firm performance. Now, if we really want to understand this long arrow, which is what most papers are trying to do, you really have to pay attention to all these complications. And of course, in the literature, some papers do this better than others, right? Some papers do care about all these other things and some papers do not. Now, I'll try to argue that we should have a closer look at the short arrows rather than looking at the long arrow first. And I found it surprising I find it surprising that there's not a lot of work done, for example, on the link between board structure and board behavior. At least not the kind of work I'm used to, okay? And <coughs> to me, I found it surprising because it is a necessary condition for this long arrow that this also has some effect. 
So again, with, uh, with my co-author, uh, Renee Adams, we decided to have a look at this. And the, first, and the first kind of behavior at the board level that we wanted to look at was attendance. So why attendance? Um, simply because in the United States, you can get very good data on the attendance behavior of individual directors. And the reason is that the SEC has a regulation that says that if a director has missed more than 25% of the meetings, it has to be flagged at the company, in the company documents. So we had looked at this data. We could actually get this data. And we've seen, as you can imagine, most people have good attendance, but there are some people that have serious attendance problems. And then our question was, OK, if a company wanted to uh, increase attendance, so I'm not going to discuss why they want to increase attendance. So this is just a New Yorker cartoon saying that, well, we have enough people to vote on the proposal, but not enough to do the wave. So maybe they want to increase attendance for no reason, just to be able to do the wave after they approve the proposal. But I'm just going to assume that, in general, I expect that better attendance is, is, is better. Right? So if I wanted to improve attendance, what should I do? And us being economists, we thought, well, maybe money. right? We just pay them to attend. Why don't companies just go and pay uh, directors to attend meetings? And we went and looked at the data, and we found out they already did that. Right? So in the US, you actually get paid to attend board meetings, which was surprising to us. We didn't know that. And they say, OK, case closed. But then we, we digged a little bit deeper. And this is the data we used at the time in 2003, but we can update the data more recently. And what we find is that the average board meeting fee was $1,000. And then we say, wait, that's way too low, right? Because these are large companies. These directors are very wealthy individuals. They will not really take this number into account when deciding to show up for a meeting or not, right? So this is just too little to make any of the difference. So it said it can't be financial incentives because they shouldn't care about this, except that they do. Right? So that was our uh, surprising finding. And uh, most people didn't believe us. And we didn't believe in our results. But now we are convinced. Uh, what we found, just by doing some back of the envelope calculations based on our estimates, that firms that increased their meeting fees by $1,000, say from 1000 to 2000 they were able to reduce attendance problems by 10%. And this is our most conservative estimate. So we're like, OK, that's a surprising finding. You know, they, not only directors respond to financial incentives, but they respond to very small financial incentives. So that was one interesting finding out of this. And then, but that was the first paper. And then we asked ourselves, what else? You know, OK, so what else could you do to improve attendance, which is not just to increase the fees? And then we found something else. Um, Actually, adding one more female director reduces male director attendance problems exactly by 10% as well. And was, that was also surprising to us. Uh, so it's not saying that uh, female directors, they have better attendance records, which they do. We can always document that. But it's more than this, that by adding one more woman to the board, you actually change the behavior of men. Right? So I don't know exactly why this is the case, but our conclusion was that board directors' attendance behavior is affected both by financial incentives and by social incentives as well, perhaps peer pressure. Now, what is interesting about this is first that once you look at these closer, um, the shorter arrows, you find some things you had no idea about, I think. It's sort of surprising results. And second, you see there is more than one way of achieving the same result. If I really wanted to, if my goal was to reduce attendance problems, there are two things I can do. I can give you a thousand bucks more, or I can just add one woman to the board. It will lead to the same thing. Now, if you extrapolate this, you see there are many different ways of getting exactly the same behavior, which again suggests this idea of one size fits all doesn't seem to be true when you look closer up at what boards really do. Now. Let me give you a second example of another short arrow, now looking at the determinants of board appointments to board characteristics. So who controls appointments? 
you would think, well, it's either shareholders or maybe the firm itself, maybe the CEO, if the CEO is very powerful. Now, let me give you a different example. And this is, um, so now this is just an example for now. This I, I took from Reuters, it's just some news uh, release. It says that a struggling Irish uh, telecoms firm, Aircom, has appointed several independent directors as part of a deal with lenders to waive conditions of its debt. So what is the story here? Let me explain this. This company, like many, has borrowed from banks. And usually when you borrow from banks, you know, you write a loan contract with a lot of restrictive covenants of things you can do and things you cannot do, and, 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 and giving some special rights to uh, creditors in case your profitability is too low, in case your debt is too high, and things like that. So very often, and this is actually very common, you will find that the, comp the company will be in what is called <coughs> technical default, because the company will be violating one of these companies. And normally what happens is that the company will go and talk to the banks and say, well, look, we have violated this covenant. Can you please waive this condition for us? And the banks would normally say yes, but we, are, we want something in return, okay? So in this particular example, one of the things they wanted in return, which is a bit surprising, is that, well, maybe you have to change your board. You, want to, you need to appoint more independent directors. So now the question is, is this just a one-off? This is, you know, is this something that happened only in this company, but it's not something that happens elsewhere? So in another paper um, uh, with other co-authors, what we found, looking at a much larger data set, is that indeed the number of independent directors increases by roughly 30% in the first few years following a long renegotiation of that sort, driven by a covenant violation. Okay. Now, what are the possible implications of this? So, so what we're saying here is that what we're uncovering is that creditors also have an influence on the composition of the boards, which is something that people really didn't take into account. That most of the time, creditors have no say, but in some cases, they do, right? Now, let me speculate a little bit now. So this is no longer a fact. It's just my speculation based on this fact that creditors appear to prefer more independent boards, OK? So if creditors do prefer a more independent board, the first question is why, OK? So one possibility is that independent directors, they tend to be more conservative in the sense that they prefer safer projects. And if, if, if this is the case, then it's no mystery why banks prefer independent directors, because what banks want is for, their fir is for firms they lend to, to, take, uh, to be very safe. They don't want them to gamble, to take risks, because they don't benefit from this risk. They actually want the company to have enough cash flow to pay them back. So if this is the case, and if this is the reason why banks prefer independent directors, then it follows that those firms that actually benefit from risk taking, they shouldn't really have that many independent directors. So the companies that are growing or innovative firms, you know, which would benefit a lot from risk taking, perhaps they shouldn't have that many independent directors. In fact, the evidence is, uh, fits that story. I mean, we do know that growing innovative firms have fewer independent directors. I don't know the real reason, right? So again, I'm speculating. But I'm, what I'm saying is that by looking at something completely different, I can get a story that can possibly explain and rationalize another interesting fact out there. And let me give you my final example, and then we'll stop. Um, I don't want to give the impression that only short arrows are important, that short arrows are, is the only way to go. My point is simply that people have focused too much on these long arrows going from board characteristics to firm performance, rather than looking more closely at relationships that are much more they're much easier for us to interpret and to understand. Now, it is also possible to do some careful research looking at long arrows. So I'll give you an example of something that we've done here, also at the LSC, linking the determinant of board appointments to firm performance and to firm decisions. 
Okay. So now the the price we pay is that one once we take the long arrow approach, things become more speculative. So we talk more about prediction than actual causation, right? But we can still learn something, and sometimes something very interesting. So let me give you my final example. So what if boards are indeed insulated from shareholder pressure? What if it is very difficult to actually change the board to replace board members? So how could this be? Um, again, in the United States, it's, it's very common for firms to have provisions in their charters and bylaws that restrict the ability of shareholders to replace board members. Okay? I'm not going to explain what these are because you know, there can be many of these uh, restrictions, but it simply makes it difficult and very costly for existing shareholders to replace the existing um, board members. And what's also true is that those insulation provisions are difficult to remove and thus they can last for a long time. So we can look at, at the past and see that those provisions are there and they remain there for many, many years. So what we've done, again, with some uh, colleagues from, FM, from the FMG and from the law department as well, is that we look at commercial banks in the United States uh, previous and during the financial crisis. And in a nutshell, this is what we found. We got data from these provisions in 2003 and classified these banks as being more insulated from shareholder pressure or less insulated from shareholder pressure. So in a nutshell, what we found is that those banks that were more insulated, remember, more insulated means that shareholders have very little say in the company. These banks were less likely to take risks before the crisis. And also, they were 18 percentage points less likely to be bailed out in 2008, 2009. Right? So we found that this was a very surprising result. And many people found it very surprising because uh, if you take the traditional view of governance that you know, shareholder influence is good, here we're saying that exactly those banks that had more potential for being influen influenced by shareholders, they took more risks and they ended up being the ones most likely to be bailed out. Let me finish with a few takeaways. So the takeaways that I want to uh, highlight here are the following. So first, that academic research reveals that boards do matter. Hopefully, you're convinced of that. Uh, but more importantly is that they matter in subtle and often surprising ways. So I chose in just very few examples but I chose in examples that hopefully they were not too obvious and they were a little bit surprising uh, to at least to some of you. And furthermore, I think there is enough evidence that directors do perform multiple roles. It's, they are not there just to monitor managers. And consequently, the friendly boards are not always bad. Sometimes they are bad, sometimes they are not bad. And if we want to have some uh, policy recommendation out of this, which I'm often reluctant to, to give. I would say that regulation that pushes, for example, for more independence and for more shareholder empowerment can have sometimes unintended consequences, as the financial crisis has revealed, exactly those banks that were more insulated from shareholder pressure, they sort of did better during the financial crisis. So uh, if we really believe that there is no one size fit all policy that should be uh, imposed on all boards, we should be very careful when we push for types of one size fit all um, uh, policy proposals. So that's it. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, people that do want to rush away, if you want to rush away in the next few minutes, it's probably best to go now, because otherwise we get an interrupted discussion. Hopefully not too many of you. It's okay. <laughs>
So what, uh, what I'm going to do now is take uh, questions. Uh, I'm just going to take them one at a time, um, rather than batches. Uh, but asking your question, perhaps you can identify who you are and um, to try to keep your questions relatively brief. And uh, we'll take them there. So, Sir Geoffrey. My name is Geoffrey Owen. Oh, thanks. Geoffrey Owen, LSE. You mentioned, I think, earlier, <coughs> earlier in your talk how difficult it is to find out what happens inside a ball because the minutes aren't published and so on and so on. Now, there have been a number of cases in the UK and I'm sure in other places where boards have taken very bad decisions or companies have taken very bad decisions approved by the boards. One thinks of Tesco going to the United States or Royal Bank of Scotland buying um, the Dutch bank. Now, would it be possible for academic researchers, not perhaps in the immediate aftermath of such disasters, but maybe after a few years have elapsed, to interview the directors who participated in those decisions and ask them how these decisions were taken, wouldn't an interview-based approach to the way boards behave at any rate supplement the more uh, kind of data-driven approach which you and your colleagues have done? Or is that something that academics don't do? Um, okay, so I couldn't agree more. I think that the type of qualitative, qualitative research that you are suggesting, first, it does exist already, right? So it's not what we do most of the time because of our being, an, being economists, that's not our comparative advantage. But it does happen a lot. And I, I personally think that it is indeed very useful. And it complements the kind of research that is more um, based on large data sets that we do. Uh, the difficulty with kind of interview-based research, as you can imagine, is how you're going to extrapolate to other uh, situations. But I, I want to add to this as well that um, although it's difficult to get information about what goes on inside boards, there are a few opportunities here and there to get data from board minutes as well. So there have been a few papers using large data sets of board minutes, still not as large as we want them to be. And even uh, we here have access to, you know, we are working on a project with board minutes from Italian firms. Um, and we are finding many interesting things in there. We don't have anything yet to report because it's in a very preliminary stage. So I do think that there are, these are all important routes that we have to take. We, if we have access to board minutes, you know, we should definitely use that data. Sometimes the, the, the data is not going to be of qual good quality because board minutes may not be informative at all. But we found that it varies a lot across companies. In some companies, you can clearly, clearly see that the board minutes are not really saying what happened in the board. Uh, but in some other cases, you can clearly see that it's true. And we actually have interviewed some directors that have been in these meetings to ask them for how accurate these discussions are. Right? So I think that's a sort of in the middle of the way approach that by looking at board minutes, you can still do some relatively large data analysis, while at the same try time trying to get uh, more into these qualitative things that actually happens inside the board. But I think the interview, interviewing approach I think is very valid. I'm personally uh, very interested in, 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 in such results. And there are a few of large surveys as well in which you survey many different directors. And although most of the evidence you get from these surveys, it's again um, only suggestive, but I think they are also very useful. Thank, thank you. Uh, Tim, and then I'll take the, these two and I've got you. Yeah. Tim Frost. Tim Frost, I'm a graduate of the LSE. First of Tim Frost. Uh, I'm interested if you've done any work on the cohesiveness of boards and, and whether united boards or fractured boards are, are more or less influential. And ask the question in a particular context where I would be surprised but impressed if you'd done work already. There are proposals certainly here in the 
UK uh, in, in the financial services industry to make individual board members uh, personally responsible for aspects of corporate control, chairman or chairwomen of audit committees and remuneration committees. Um, how have you done any work that would um, uh, enable you to express a view on whether or not that would change the dynamics of the board in that one board director is personally responsible for an aspect of corporate performance, but other directors are not? Um, I guess the short answer is no, I haven't done any research on, on, on this question, although uh, it is definitely um, uh, a very important um, uh, um, uh, question to address. I believe there might be a few papers using uh, US data that have look at some similar things, but not exactly what, what you just said. Um, the problem with this specific proposal is that it hasn't really happened yet. So uh, unfortunately, the kind of data analysis that we do is always backward looking. You know, we only, you know, once it is in, once something is implemented, then we can have a look back and see how it changed. But I would definitely be very interested in know if there was a way of seeing exactly what happens inside the boardroom as a consequence of this uh, policy change. You know, I would definitely uh, like to work on that. But for now, um, we haven't done anything on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, this lady here. Thank you very much, Professor, for your enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm Sana Musharraf. Have you got that switched on? Yeah. Well, I'm Sana Musharraf, student at LSE Law and Accounting. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you how important is culture, cultural context to board dynamism and performance, and how can it be a detrimental factor because culture does not evolve or change immediately takes generations. And secondly, as a multinational enterprise, or for a multinational enterprise, would diversi diversity, not just gender diversity, but diversity in terms of bringing people from different mm -hmm. cultures, let's say if GM, I'm not sure about how their boards composed, but yes, they're selling all over the world, but would they want um, non-executive or executive directors from Europe or Japan mm -hmm. or the other major markets or Australia for that matter. And how to manage that aspect of intercultural dynamism on the boards of multinational enterprises. Thank you. Okay, um, let me say a few things that are related to, 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 to your question because your question has many different dimensions. Um, one thing we do know, at, uh, especially for s smaller companies, is that boards are very local, right, in the case of smaller companies. So, so that's something that the empirical literature has also uncovered and is a very robust fact. When we move, so because they're very local, they tend not to be very diverse. And actually, even if you look at dimension, any kind of dimension of diversity that you want, um, because boards are very local, um, they pretty much reflect the, the, you know, the situation of the region where they are. So because of that, if you look across the United States and places where you see more women on boards, exactly those places where you expect to have more business women, right? And if you're located some other place in which you don't see a lot of business women, the boards also tend not to have a lot of women. So you, you have um, all these local effects are pretty much there. Now when you move to larger companies and to multinational companies, you can clearly see that the diversity is a goal, right? So if you look at if you look at the composition of GM, which I don't remember, but I I, I look at the composition of GE recently, and you can clearly see it's a large board. Almost everyone on the board, except the CEO, is an independent director, and there's a lot of concern for diversity, not only gender diversity, but many different kinds of of, of diversity as well. So you can clearly see that larger corporations are concern about these different dimensions of diversity. And I would expect that the cultural factors definitely would affect uh, the dynamics and behavior of the board. Now, what more do we know? I don't think we know much more than this. We know that corporations are 
to some extent interested in having a more diverse board. It tends to be though, those companies that are larger and more mature. You don't see that much diversity in smaller and growing and innovative firms for a number of reasons that we don't fully understand yet. But this is an area of research that is really only starting in my view and then we still, there's still a lot that we have to do and it depends a lot on our, uh, on our ability to get data uh, that is relevant uh, in the sense of telling us something about the dynamics of the board, which is often very difficult to get. I think the I think the answer is it depends, right? Even the the few papers that we have on these issues, not only on gender diversity but also other uh, forms of diversity, they sort of suggest that some amount of diversity is good for some firms, but perhaps not good for different firms. So there is some variation. So as of now, the answer would be. It depends. Again, it's one size does not fit all. Maybe diversity, some, some types of diversity might be good for some firms, but m may not be good for different firms. Mm -hmm. There was a question. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Um, so my question is about the, the impact of independence. So you mentioned that it's a positive thing. Did you also review the level of tenure, so, so the average tenure of board members, and whether that had an impact on their independence? Uh, okay, so... Uh, so I, I wouldn't claim that uh, independence is a good thing. I'll say there are papers that claim that independence is a good thing, uh, but there are a number of papers that claim that independence may be good and may be bad, and that's the view I take, that independence is not always good. Now you ask about tenure, right? And uh, there again, there are a number of papers looking at the effect of long tenure directors, whether this is good for performance or not. I, I take the same view that it's, it's unlikely to be, you know, good for all firms or bad for all firms. There are some more subtle studies that look, for example, at whether directors have been appointed before the CEO. So, they could, so sometimes a long tenure director may be more independent because he was not appointed by the CEO. And some papers have made a claim that these directors, they tend to be more independent and therefore better, right? So I agree with the, with the first step, with, with the first conclusion that perhaps they, these directors are probably more independent because they have, not been, they have not been appointed by the CEO, but not necessarily that then that makes them better. Maybe that makes them better monitors and sometimes it's good to have them or not. Uh, the, yeah. Hi there. <coughs> Daryl Scheinman, uh, um, I suppose, serial board director and uh, serial entrepreneur. Um, actually, following on from that question, do you think there's an optimal hiring policy for uh, board directors? Because I've served on a couple of public boards and um, several smaller company boards. Mm -hmm. And it would seem that the smaller company boards tend to appoint people who are friends of the CEO or friends of other directors. And they often allow, uh, the, the, the allowance for um, risk taking is better, but I'm not sure it functions as well as a board because trysts can be formed and so on. And the larger um, public outfits that I've been on tend to use uh, proxy contests by default um, after every three years. And they, those boards can function often very well, although of course these public bodies tend not to take as much risk. Is there an optimal way to hire for a board? Okay, so um, a short answer I would be that I think not. I think there is no optimal way, uh, no optimal hiring policy for the board. I think that's probably firm specific. Um, I take your point that perhaps smaller companies, they tend to hire directors who are just friends with the CEO, right? And therefore they are probably not uh, very strong monitors. Um, I'm not sure whether this is always a bad thing for smaller companies. So I, I take the view that perhaps it makes sense for smaller companies, especially those companies in which ownership is not very dispersed and is more concentrated, that the typical corporate governance problems that we care about, maybe they're not so much of an issue in those cases. And what we really want um, out, of the, um, um, out of the board members is some other role that they function. You may also question that maybe that's not reasonable because uh, if we want to hire those directors because they 
are going to give us business advice, again, maybe we shouldn't just go for the friends of the CEO. So I take this point uh, as well. But it might also be the case that especially for uh, smaller firms, even if you do, if, even if an optimal hiring policy does exist, it's probably a costly one. Right? So you need very good HR help and consultants and etc. And maybe only the larger firms can really afford to do that or can have any hope of getting people with a lot of experience that, because they would only want to serve in the largest companies. So even if there was um, an optimal director that even the smaller companies would like to get, there's also the question whether they would be able to get these people. And in the absence of these people, maybe the best option available to them is this to hire the people they actually know, right? So my answer would be I'm skeptical that there is an optimal hiring policy. And I wouldn't take the fact that some of the smaller firms just hire uh, their friends as evidence that they're doing something wrong. It could be wrong, I agree, but it's, it's not completely clear to me. Sorry. Um, I think you're first, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Roger Barker from the IOD. Um, I just wonder how you reconcile your conclusions with a lot of the big cases of the financial crisis. You know, if you think about, for example, the experience of Fred Goodwin at RBS, or Dick Fuld at Lehman Brothers, or Hank Greenberg at AIG, and you know, there are man many other cases. I mean, th they all seem to be examples of where the management basically could do ex exactly what it wanted. You know, these people were so dominant so hard to question that they, they essentially could get their own way. The board didn't seem to make any difference. Um, in a lot of cases, it seems that the boards were gripped in the, in the grip of, of groupthink, um, a very sort of consensus-oriented groupthink which, which went along uh, with the management. Um, and they didn't really be, they weren't particularly interested in fulfilling a monitoring role. In fact, they were very, you know, friendly um, sort of boards that didn't want to be a kind of corporate policeman. So, you know, it would appear, certainly from what we've heard about the experience of those boards, that, um, you know, that they, they didn't sort of comply with the conclusions which, which you came to. And, uh, you know, the, the second point I just quickly wanted to make is really just to you know, point to a lot of the, the big technology companies which you see in Silicon Valley, like Facebook, Google, um, Amazon, and so on. And they actually seem to be trying to block out the influence of shareholders because, I mean, their, their argument is they can only innovate and take risks over the longer term if they actually neutralize the impact of shareholders um, so that they're not affected by, you know, short-term shareholder pressures. So I just wonder if that also perhaps is a challenge to your, your, your fifth conclusion. So these are two excellent questions. Um, I think I do have answers to them, which is good. Um, whether the answers are good or not is a different issue. Um, so first, uh, about the banks and uh, during the financial crisis. Actually, um, my interpretation of what happened is that managers and CEOs and boards were doing exactly what shareholders wanted them to do at the time. So in most cases, in Lehman and etc., you didn't see shareholders revolting against what they were doing. If anything, they were um, unhappy if uh, with those institutions that were not really just riding the bubble, if you want to call it that way, right? And it's not just our paper that sort of has this conclusion. There's a number of other papers, you know, written roughly at the same time, looking at different mechanisms, and they all come to a very similar conclusion, that exactly those boards and those companies in which the incentives seem to be very much aligned with the incentives of the shareholders. So that, perhaps that's why there was no conflicts, because both shareholders, boards, and CEOs, they all agree with, with the same thing. They were just trying to do what they thought it was best for shareholders, and shareholders what, thought it was best for, them, for themselves. And in the end, maybe this was bad for society as a whole. Maybe the boards were not monitoring um, um, these banks thinking about, well, what if there is a financial crisis? What if we have to be bailed out and things like that? 
Okay? So I think that's my interpretation of what happened. I think it fits your story as well. And I think it fits my story is that, yes, these CEOs were doing whatever they wanted, but you didn't see shareholders revolting. The shareholders were pretty much aligned with that. And I think that fits our story relatively well. The second question about the Silicon Valley, I would claim it also fits our story. I think that's exactly what um, I was saying, I guess, at, at the end. It is true that many of these companies, they have tried to um, insulate themselves from shareholder pressure right, by adopting dual class shares and many other mechanisms to, uh, uh, um, to, to, to make sure that shareholders don't have much of a say in what they do. And their explanation has always been, we invest for the long run, we don't want to be uh, affected by what happens in the short run, we don't want to be as short termist as the stock market requires us to be, and that's why we're going to put those things in place. Now this is, I think, this is compatible with some of the other evidence that we have out there, that those firms that are innovating more, taking up more complex and risky projects, they really don't want to be much responsive to shareholders, and maybe that's a good thing. So having a more independent board, for example, for these companies is not a good thing, and normally companies of that sort, they choose to have a less independent board. So I don't think it's surprising that they choose other, also other mechanisms to insulate themselves from shareholder pressure, such as dual class shares and other things. So I think it, it does fit the story that we are talking about here. Thank you. Right. So I've got you at the back. I've got a question here, then I'll come to you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Hans Hurt from Hermes Fund Managers. <clears throat> got just a quick quick question, really following up from <clears throat> what, what, what Roger was asking, and it's con con <clears throat> concerns stewardship and the, the whole question, does engagement of investors with, with companies, does it actually add, add something um, to, to, the, to the work of, of boards? And we certainly at Hermes think it's very important that shareholders engage with companies, have a dialogue around strategy, around business performance. But your, your, your previous um, research seems to suggest shareholder empowerment and <clears throat> giving shareholders more voice is actually detrimental, which puts a big question mark on, on the whole stewardship debate, which is now sort of taking, uh, is, is proliferating around the world, which is, which is very concerning if, if that's really the, um, the, the right outcome. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that engaging with shareholders is detrimental. I, I guess what we're trying to say here is that it could be detrimental in some cases. I think most people assume that engagement with shareholders is naturally a good thing. So of course we focus our research to show something more surprising that there are cases in which engagement with shareholders could actually lead to some problems. It could be detrimental sometimes to shareholders themselves, but in this particular example that we gave maybe more to society or you know to the to the taxpayer and maybe to creditors, but not necessarily uh, to shareholders. So I think the point that we want to bring home is that although in many situations, you know, more engagement with shareholders is surely something good that we want to encourage in many cases, we also see the role of insulation from shareholders in some cases. And the difficulty is to find the right mix. So the kind of research we do is a bit frustrating because it never leads to an answer, do this or do that. It's always an, something like it depends. And so what we want to caution against is this idea that, well, maybe there's some policy um, reforms that could push, that could improve governance in an unambiguous way. And we think that this is very difficult, right? Um, maybe maybe some more subtle policies that affect the way that boards are chosen and which firms operate may have um, um, better outcomes. But the thing is, even if we talk about some companies that, that place some restrictions on, on the ability of shareholders to uh, affect decisions, you have to see that at some point this was imposed by some shareholder, right? At some point, shareholders that were, uh, you know, that were probably in the, in the majority or had some say, eventually they decide to 
close the door for the future shareholders. And the question is, is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Still, it was chosen by shareholders. It could be, it should have been good at least for the shareholders who chose to do that. So I wouldn't go as far as saying that engagement with shareholders is a bad thing. I think in most cases, it is a good thing. I think that's the natural case. And we're trying to point out the counterexamples rather than saying that this is the most common case. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah, I know. I've got, I've got the mic micro. Can you get that mi other microphone over to the other corner, please, for the next question? Sorry, Michael. Yeah. Actually, I think you've answered my question with the last response, but uh, just to make sure. Uh, so it sounds like the main thrust here is to, oh, I'm Michael Barsley, head of the Department of Management, LSE. Um, the, the main thrust uh, seems to be to um, explain why uh, policymakers or, or those who are inventing codes of uh, board conduct right, um, should not be satisfied with a very straightforward uh, proposition for how to improve board functioning and uh, for, uh, for performance. Um, and the uh, main way you're doing that is to show these counterexamples, so to speak, right? Uh, uh, to show how difficult it is to make uh, simple conclusions, particularly simple conclusions that require confidence about one of the big arrows. That seems to be the, the main point. I'm wondering um, if, if you were to turn to more, uh, uh, the, not so much the skeptical argument, but uh, the, the prescriptive argument that would fit your tastes, <laughs> What would it kind of be like? Um, and I'm just wondering whether, if you were to do that, it would be very important to delineate these different board functions as you uh, describe them, the monitoring function, the advising function, and so on and so forth. Because it seems like implicit in your uh, research and, and thought about it, um, arrangements that would further effectiveness for one function might actually undermine the ability to as effective for another. And I'm just wondering if the concept of these uh, functions would help um, uh, better characterize the trade-offs. That is to say, you have trade-offs and effectiveness across functions. You could identify what are the characteristics, uh, either the, the designed-in characteristics of the board, and how they would tend to favor a good effectiveness undercut the effectiveness on the other. Is that more or less the structure of the thought? And if so, are you trying to push that? Well, I, I think so. I think uh, you put it very well. Um, what I would like to do, if possible, is to understand exactly how the different characteristics or the different structure of a board um, would affect the behavior of the board in many different dimensions. If I could see all these different characteristics mixing together and affecting the different functions of the board in a specific way. So a better understanding of that, then I'll be more confident in having some prescriptive, prescriptive solutions. Right? So as of now, I think we know so little that, and, and, that it's, it's, it's a bit dangerous to have policy proposals that says, well, this characteristic is good, independence is good, this is good, and this is bad. I think we know very little about it. So I'm not so skeptical to say that we will never know, and maybe there is no possible policy that will ever make sense. I wouldn't go that far. But I think we have to spend more time looking at the dynamics of the board and how these different characteristics interact with each other and how they affect the different functions of the board. So only after that, I'll be more comfortable with making more prescri prescriptive um, uh, proposals um, it may take a long time. On the other hand, I mean, just to be a bit more optimistic, um, there are some situations in which you can clearly identify some kind of externality that is very easy to see, and maybe there are things you can do. So I'm a little bit more um, open to the possibility of some regulation in some industries that are already regulated, such as banking. Okay, so I think our interpretation of our findings is that because banks know and shareholders know they're going to be bailed out, or at least they knew at the time, and there's evidence that they sort of expected to be bailed out anyway, 
that they were just playing with someone else's money anyway, and they were all aligned to take excessive risks. Now, in situations like that, I will be more than happy, for example, to have proposals in which says that directors in banks or in regulated companies like those should also take into account the interests of creditors or taxpayers when making their decisions. So I wouldn't necessarily oppose to such kind of policies, although I don't know exactly what's going on inside the board, I can clearly see the potential for a specific kind of externality that is created by regulation in the first place and maybe should be fixed by regulation. Far corner. when it comes to uh, supervisory boards in state-owned companies or in companies where the state has a major stake? Um, okay, that's, that's a good question. There's not a lot of work comparing uh, the behavior of state-owned companies with, um, with private, privately run companies, and that's an area where we should do more. Um, I haven't done work myself on this area. What we do have, we have some papers, and, and in particular there's, a, there's an interesting paper looking at state-owned companies in Israel and where they have very detailed data on board minutes on things they actually do inside the board. Now what they conclude in that study is that boards don't really do much. Um, that um, they usually don't disagree with management and, and they also don't seem to, um, um, to give, more, give much advice. So some of the conclusions of that paper was that, you know, there doesn't seem that boards are doing a lot. My interpretation of the paper is that may, it doesn't seem like boards of government-run companies in Israel are not doing a lot. Um, I've seen uh, minutes of, the, as I said, I mentioned, when I look at the Italian companies still, which are privately run, and I look at their minutes, and it paints a very different picture from what we see in the government-run companies, right? But definitely we don't, we still don't have enough work done on comparing the two. Uh, this is the last question from this young lady here. Yeah. Okay, so about expertise and independence. Um, those two things in principle can be separated, right? And in many cases, they are naturally separated that if you have a lot of expertise in one specific industry, you're more likely to be an insider of that industry and more likely to have links with the company. So um, I think the, um, the current evidence that we have, which is, again, it's still very suggestive, it's not definitive, is that in those innovative companies, you're, more likely, you're less likely to find the independent directors, but you are more likely to find um, um, directors that have, for example, expertise in specific businesses or in other innovative companies or in the particular industry. So I think it's, it's possible to separate these two things. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for the very good questions and being a lively and interactive audience. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you here again. But I suppose the person we need to thank the most is our speaker, uh, Professor Ferreira, for a stimulating talk. So thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs>